Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today to hear Dr. Bear F. Braumuller. Dr. Braumuller is a professor in the Department of Political Science at the Ohio State University, not a Ohio State. He previously held faculty positions at Harvard University and the University of Illinois at, Chirpain, at Urbana-Champaign. He is or has been on the editorial boards for five major journals or series. And he is the past counselor of the Peace Science Society. In the summer of 2016, he was a visiting fellow at the Nobel Institute in Oslo, Norway. Professor Braumuller's research is in the areas of international security and computational social sciences. His current research focus is on the relationship between international order and international conflict. His substantive research includes an original book-length systemic theory of international relations titled The Great Powers in the International System, which was the winner of the 2014 International Studies Association Best Book Award and the 2014 J. David Singer Book Award. His latest book, which was recently published, is on the decline of war thesis entitled Only the Dead, The Persistence of War in the Modern Age, a topic very relevant to all of us here today. Dr. Brownweaver, thank you again for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for the invitation. This is, uh, this is an especially uh, meaningful uh, visit for me. My father was uh, actually a member of the Army Air Corps uh, and flew the hump in World War II. And I think if he were still with us, uh, the sight of his egghead son setting foot on the campus of West Point would be enough to do him in. Um, but uh, so I'd like to, to dedicate this lecture to him. Um, first, I, I should tell you a little bit about my own background. Uh, I was a University of Chicago uh, undergraduate and um, studied a lot, studied international relations, international security, mostly from the point of view of, of uh, history and theory. Right? And then I had a conversation when I was deciding where to go for graduate school, I had a conversation with, uh, with a faculty member who said, what do you think of quantitative international relations? What do you think of, of using numbers to study politics? And uh, with all the confidence of a University of Chicago undergraduate in his fourth year, I said, uh, I, I think it's complete crap. And fortunately, he had a sense of humor. It turns out he was one of the top five political methodologists in the country, and I had no idea. Um, he also turned out to be uh, a friend and a mentor in, the, in subsequent years. Um, and turned me over to the dark side, I guess, is, uh, um, is how he would probably put it but it showed me the utility of, of thinking about data in the context of history and history in the context of data and the rich interplay that can exist between uh, theory and numbers when you're not just sort of putting numbers into the hopper and turning the crank. So that's the kind of work that I've tried to do subsequently and that's the, the background that led me uh, when I saw that the decline of war thesis was becoming a topic that people really cared about and were talking about, led me to think this is something that I should take on. So today I want to do a few things. Um, first, I want to talk about um, uh, arguments and data on the, the decline of war question, right? most, most fundamentally. Um, and then I wanted to mention a couple of big questions that come out of that research and talk a little bit about sort of preliminary, follow, uh, preliminary discussion of follow-up research that I'm engaging in and then some closing observations that tie all of this into sort of where we are in the present situation. Uh, and a few takeaways from this that I think are important. First of all, uh, what I find is you don't see any long-term decline of war regardless of how you measure it. Okay. There is a, a slight drop after the end of the Cold War in uh, the rate of conflict initiation, but it looks more like sort of a return to the status quo ante from a very unusual period of history than it does uh, sort of a, a long-term decline. Second, one of the things that really was really brought home to me in the course of this research is that war has vastly more escalatory potential than most people realize, and we don't know why it has that potential to escalate the way that it does. Um, which to me is one of the most frightening, uh, chapter five of this book is one of the most depressing chapters you're ever gonna read anywhere. 
Um, I, as a matter of fact, I started the conclusion by saying, I was originally just going to write, we're all going to die and leave it at that. And I didn't do that, not because it was too alarmist, but because it wasn't specific enough. So today I'll try to be a bit uh, more specific about, uh, about that conclusion. Third, there is some hope, I think, in understanding how international order works and how international order and international conflict relate to one another, but the relationship between the two is not straightforward. And we'll talk about that a little bit. And finally, I think uh, an analogy that I've, that I've used in the past that I think resonates with people is that where we are now in history, we are a lot like people in an earthquake-prone region that just hasn't seen a lot of earthquakes recently. Right? But nothing fundamental about the way earthquakes happens has changed. But because we haven't seen them recently, we've decided to let our earthquake insurance slide. And my, one of my biggest um, uh, and strongest suggestions is we, should, we really shouldn't be doing that. Right? We really need to think hard, especially now, about what the next war and wars are going to look like and, and what we can do to mitigate the danger. All right, so all of this started with Steven Pinker's book, uh, The Better Angels of Our Nature. Uh, I had actually taught a little bit about the decline of war, uh, but only in the context of an example in the classroom, right? It wasn't something that I thought was an interesting, um, you know, interesting topic to pursue. Why is that? Because academic political scientists can be idiots. We, d we don't really have a good understanding sometimes of the sorts of topics that are going to catch the public attention or the kinds of questions that people are going to be interested in. So when, when Better Angels of Our Nature came out, all of a sudden, the thing I do for a living was the topic of conversation all over the place. People wanted to know, you know, is this true uh, that, re that we're seeing this decline of war? And uh, Professor Pinker's argument is pretty ambitious. I mean, he, he argues that not just international conflict, but conflict of all kinds, use of all force, uh, all the way from, you know, within the, the context of a family all the way up to international relations has declined over the course of, of centuries, right? His only concession um, to, to uh, the only exception to that is the deadliness of international conflict, um, which he argues has declined since 1945. I mean, it's hard, uh, it's hard to have World War II sitting in the middle of your timeline and argue that, uh, that war has been decline, in decline for the entire time. Um, and he ends up saying, you know, we live in the most peaceful period in human history. And when you, when you ask him, uh, is that likely to continue? In the book, he says, you know, this is all statistics. Anyone who understands statistics is never going to say never. You know, you could always have a, a return to the way things were before. But when he's talking about the book, and in the b bottom half of the slide, I have a quote from an NPR interview where he says, you know, uh, that a return to, to large-scale warfare among industrialized countries is about as likely as a return to throwing virgins into volcanoes in order to make the weather better, which I, I hope, by which I hope he means it's not likely. Right? So that's the, that's the basic layout. And when I started reading the book, uh, I started thinking, you know, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure about the evidence and the arguments here. And what I want to do before I get into the evidence that I lay out is talk about some of the reasons I had for being skeptical, okay? Because, um, you know, a lot of people have bought into the decline of war thesis, and I think it's necessary to show just a few of the examples that, uh, that crossed, crossed my mind as I was reading the book and why they struck me as being problematic. First, he makes a big deal out of what John Lewis Gadd has called the long peace, right, the absence of really big systemic wars among major powers since World War II. Right? And his, his argument is, you know, this, is, this really demonstrates that things have changed fundamentally. This isn't just a fluke. Right? But making that argument requires that you use statistics to measure the, the probability that it actually was a fluke. Right? How likely could these data have been to arise just by chance? So if you take a look uh, back to the 1400s, um, 
at, at data sets on major power war, what you see is on average they're about two per century. Right? So the question then becomes if, uh, you know, if the odds in any given year of having one of these wars are about one in 50, how unlikely is it that, that it would see, that we would see about a 75 year period without a large major power war? And it turns out not to be all that unlikely. It is true that the most likely outcome, uh, and this is just based on a simple binomial test, the same test that you, that you, uh, that you get if you want to measure the odds of a certain number of um, heads when you're flipping coins a certain number of times, right? Uh, it's true the most likely outcome would be one more. But about 25% of the time, uh, if you run that, if you run that rerun history, what you'd expect to see is no wars, right? So no wars is actually not all that unlikely uh, to have occurred, even if the process by which major power wars happen hasn't changed. Right? What about, like, how long would it take for us to conclude with a high degree of certainty that things have changed? Uh, the answer is longer than you might hope. It would take, if, if we use sort of 95% certainty, which is industry standard for when we believe that a change has really happened, as our benchmark, it would take about 150 years after the end of the Cold War for us to be that certain that this process has changed. Now, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not obvious that we should use that standard. We might want to you know, loosen up our confidence intervals a little bit, or loosen up our, our, the, the target value for our test statistic. But um, however you measure it, uh, you can't really conclude now that, uh, that the fundamental data generating process for major power wars has changed. All right, what about this graph, trend in battle deaths from, this is from, actually not from the book, it's from an article in the Wall Street Journal. And uh, it seems to show a fairly striking decline over time in the number of deaths from a variety of different kinds of wars, but primarily from, uh, from interstate wars. One of the problems with this graph is that it, it combines duration and, and deadliness, right? So um, just as one example, I can show you the Korean War versus the Vietnam War. Vietnam was considerably more deadly than Korea, but if you line them up like this, it looks like there's been a decline just because Korea was much, uh, people, people died a lot more quickly in, the, in Korea than they did in Vietnam. And in general, when you have data set where the, a data set where the data are really skewed, uh, you can't trust your eyeballs. This is uh, actually a sample of um, household income that I use in the book to demonstrate, and, and the setup is, you know, you're a pollster, you're calling people up and asking what their household income is, uh, and the first few that you get, you know, are, are sky high, and then after that you seem to see a downward trend. Is there something wrong with your sample? Is it not random? You know, or should you be concerned that uh, the average value seems to be declining? No, you expect to see uh, trends like that once in a while, just as a function of the skew in the data. Right? And I'll talk a little bit more about war follows a particular distribution. The deadliness of war follows a particular distribution that makes it really hard um, to use your eye to believe your eyeballs. All right, what about the frequency of conflict? This is one of the graphs from Better Angels of Our Nature. And it shows uh, a period of, what is it, 1400 to the present in Europe in which it looks like the frequency of conflict, that is the number of conflicts, has, has declined significantly. Right? I was puzzled, uh, first of all, because I hadn't run across this data set. It's something called the Conflict Catalog, and it was uh, compiled by a scholar named Peter Brecke. So I hadn't run across this data set, which is surprising because it was, uh, you know, this is in my line of work. But also I was surprised that it was limited to Europe. So I dug up the original conference paper, and this, is, this roughly looks like the graph from Europe that, uh, that appears in the book. The book uses a slightly different periodization, or sorry, the, um, the conference paper uses a slightly different periodization than the book. But graph number one in the conference paper is a graph of conflicts worldwide, and it looks like this. So that prompted even more skepticism on my part. 
right? I thought, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure that I believe the argument that war has been in decline. I'm, I'm not sure I believe the data set. The data, has, data set hasn't been um, published, it hasn't been validated. Uh, there's lots of missing data. There are a lot, of, a lot of reasons you could pick apart this data set, but if you believe this graph, then you ought to believe this graph. Uh, finally, uh, one of the examples in which he argues that civilization has led to, to greater peace and in general, this is not, not an argument that I have too much of a complaint about. But the argument here is that you see um, much lower death rates per capita in modern states than you do among pre-state societies, right? The pre-state societies, for those of you who, who uh, may not be able to read from the back, uh, the Kato in California, the Grand Valley Dani in New Guinea, uh, the Dinka in Northeast Africa, so on and so forth, right? All of these are pre-state societies that exhibit um, surprisingly high death rates um, relative to people in modern states. Um, now, it is worth asking, you know, modern states have killed a lot of their own people. Should we be concerned about that? But there's even a more fundamental problem here. And uh, those of you who have taken basic statistics classes may already have spotted it. The, the problem is that up on the top, what you've got are really small samples, right? The Kato numbered something like 1,000 people. So, you know, 1.6%, I think they're at 1. 1. 1.5, 1. 1.6%, uh, you know, 15, sorry, 1,500 war deaths per 100,000 people per year uh, actually is not that many people. Right, it's, it's the kind of outcome that you could expect uh, just by chance, right? So to bring this point home, the point that in, in smaller samples you tend to have higher variance, uh, I took a look at data on deaths by poisoning in the US, and I broke it down by county and by state. And if you believe these data, it is far more dangerous to be the resident of a county than it is to be the resident of a state which obviously makes no sense because everybody's resident of both. Right? So there are quite a few of these um, issues that came up in the context of, uh, of, of uh, discussing the, or reading through the book. The upshot is that a lot of the arguments just don't stand up to, to surface scrutiny. And it's a little disturbing that you know, almost a decade after the original book was published, I'm, I'm raising them for the first time. Uh, a lot of the data are public, these are not things that are hard to come by. Um, that said, just showing that there are problems with the data that, uh, that the original author used to support the argument doesn't necessarily mean that the argument's wrong, right? Uh, the argument could be entirely right, uh, it just could be the, the inferences in the data uh, don't work. Which was the motivation for the book uh, that I'm here to talk about today, Only the Dead, uh, from the from the Santayana quote, only the dead have seen the end of war. Uh, in addition to discussing the flaws in the existing literature, uh, what I do is use appropriate statistical tests uh, for a bunch of different phenomena to try to get a sense of whether or not there really is a decline in war. Um, at the end, I talk about the importance of uh, international order for rates of conflict initiation uh, and uh, I promised my, my editor when I started out writing it, I would write it in plain English. Uh, social science does horrible things to people's writing and, uh, and he agreed to publish it as a trade book, um, meaning it'll actually show up in Barnes and Noble, um, uh, you know, if I would write it in plain English. Uh, it's uh, typically not the fate of most academic books. They get marketed to university libraries and. Uh, you know, a small number of other academics, and that's about it. So this is, this is meant for a general audience. So the first question to come up, fundamentally, is when we talk about the decline of war, how should we measure war, right? What measure should we use to look at over time to see whether or not there's been a decline? And here, I think uh, the argument that, that Pinker lays out in part of his book makes a ton of sense. He says there isn't any one measure that you can look at to, to gauge the, uh, the, the decline of war. Right? The, uh, 
the, he uses an analogy of a village with, or two villages. One has a hundred arsonists, a hundred arsonists, but it has isolated forests. Uh, the other villages, the village has two arsonists, but the forests are very interconnected, right? Uh, and he asks, you know, which, which one has the bigger arson problem? Well, you could argue it both ways, right? So his argument is uh, that what we should be looking at is, or two things, how likely nations are to go to war in the first place, and how many people are killed when they do. Right. I add a third thing that, uh, that came out of early discussions of the book, which is the potency of the causes of war. Right. Another thing that it can mean when you say that war is in decline is that the things that used to cause war in the past do not cause war now. Right. So I look along all three dimensions. And first let me talk about the lethality of war. Um, and to be clear, here I'm talking about interstate conflict. Um, I do touch briefly on other kinds of conflict in, in the book, but you know, I'm, I'm trying to maintain a focus specifically on interstate conflict because that's the kind of conflict that's been discussed in this literature. That's the kind of, the, the, this is where the argument is, right, primarily. So the best measure, I think, is a measure that the Correlates of War Project came up with called war intensity. And war intensity is the number of battle deaths we don't have good data on civilian deaths, unfortunately, in war. Uh, as a matter of fact, we have genuinely terrible data on, on civilian deaths, even in relatively modern wars. Uh, but we have very good data on, on battle deaths. Uh, so the, the measure intensity is the total number of battle deaths divided by the pooled population of all of the countries that were combatants in a war. Right? Now, people have looked at other measures, and I'll, I'll look at them as well, just for the sake of thoroughness. One is war severity, which is just the raw number of battle deaths. I'm not as fond of that measure because it doesn't take into account the growth of population, right? but, um, but people do look at it. The other is battle deaths divided by world population, and that's the, the measure that Pinker uses. It's not typically used in the, in the conflict literature, um, but that's, yeah, that's one of the measures that he looks at, so I wanted to be as complete as possible. Now, an important note. Now, how many of you uh, have had a statistics class of some sort here before you've been here? Okay, good. This will be fun. Uh, I'm going to talk for a minute about power laws. The deadliness of war follows something called a power law distribution, which is a real pain. Um, here's the, I put the density function up there for the, for the nerds. Um, but the upshot is that it's a, it's a very, very skewed distribution where you've got lots and lots of small observations and a small number of really, really large observations. Okay, Nassim Taleb wrote a book, The Black Swan, about kind of, you know, um, power law, power law distributed phenomena. In his case, his background is in finance, so he was looking at, you know, I think a lot of the motivation came out of his interest in um, you know, really big, really unexpected financial events. But this happens in lots, of, in lots of areas. Now, the key thing to understand about power law distributions, aside from the unbelievable skew of the distribution, is they have terrible small sample properties. So here, what I'm gonna do is show you what happens to your estimate of the mean of a normal distribution as you go from a sample of zero to one to two to three to four to five, all the way up to 5,000. Now the underlying mean in the population is that dotted line, okay? So what you're seeing is as the number of observations grows, the sample mean converges to the population mean, right? And actually in this case, it takes a surprising amount of time to get as close as it does, but sometimes that happens, right? This is what gives us the central limit theorem. This is what allows us to do statistical inference. This is what allows us to take a sample of, you know, a thousand people and make inferences about the American population, right? This is the only reason we can do that is that the sample mean converges to the population mean. Well, when you have a really skewed distribution like a power law distribution, that just doesn't happen in any reasonable number of observations. Right, so here's a, here is the, 
running mean of a power law distribution, you can see it's relatively low relative to the actual population mean. Then you get a huge observation, a spike all the way up. I mean, the mean is just a little over 100, but, um, but if you have 4,000 observations, you can still believe that it's three or 400, right? It can be way, way off. Um, it can also be low, right? Here's another run of what power law distributed data can look like in a large sample. You can just have, by, by virtue of luck, a surprisingly low number of, uh, of big events. And your, your running mean can be significantly below where you would expect it to be. Um, or you can have both, right? You can have a big spike at the beginning and then a run of small numbers. Uh, so in order to get to, in order to have the, the um, sample mean converge to the population mean, you need far, far more observations than we are ever realistically going to have, especially in the case of war. So what do we do? Well, some people who are smarter than I am figured out something interesting about power law distributions, and that is that the mean of a power law distribution depends primarily on the slope of the distribution when you log uh, both the x-axis and the y-axis. When you log the x and y-axis for a power law distribution, what you see is a straight line, right? And the slope of that line is hugely determinative of the mean of the distribution. So rather than trying to compare uh, the mean of a power law uh, distribution, which, for which you can't use the central limit theorem at all, the, the slope of the distribution, the slope of the, of the line in log log space, uh, the sampling distribution actually is, is close to normally distributed. It's a gamma distribution. Right? But, um, but it's, it's relatively easy to compare the slopes of these distributions. So the strategy for figuring out whether or not uh, war has become more deadly or less deadly is to look at the slope of the data, the slope of the line that runs through the, the central tendency of the data in log-log space. And if you see a shallow slope, what that means is that the, the phenomenon that you're looking at is very prone to escalation, right? You can get from, uh, from a very low intensity to a very high intensity relatively easily when the slope is shallow. When the slope is steeper, that means you're looking at a system that is less escalation prone, okay? So that's the main thing to keep in mind when we're comparing uh, power law distributions. Now, with all that background, what happens when we take a look at the deadliness of war before World War II and after World War II? What we see is that the slopes of the pre-World War II and the post-World War II lines are almost identical. Right? There's virtually no difference between the slopes of these two lines. Now, in part, this is because when you measure the intensity of war, you're measuring something that doesn't necessarily um, connect immediately to the idea of world war, right? World wars are not the most intense wars in the data set. Uh, the Paraguay War in the 1800s um, was a war in which Paraguay lost something like 70% of its adult male population. The Iran-Iraq War in the 1980s um, was a horrific bloodletting, right? When, when judged by the standard of war intensity, these were both extremely intense wars, right? So, that's part of the reason that we don't, uh, that this seems a little bit counterintuitive. Um, but if you take a formal statistical look at the difference between the two slopes, what you see is this. Uh, these, these distributions are sampling distributions. If there is a difference that is statistically significant, those distributions should be far apart, right? The fact that they overlap almost entirely means that the difference could very well be due to chance which is actually a good thing because the post-World War II slope is actually slightly shallower than the pre-World War, World War II slope, meaning that if there were a significant difference, it would mean that war has gotten worse rather than better. And I promised different measures. Um, if we look at the severity of war, you don't see a difference in the slope coefficients. If you look at war as a percentage of world population, uh, you don't see a difference in the, in the slopes of the power law coefficients. However you measure it, the answer is pretty straightforward, no change, right? which is bad news. Uh, and it's considerably worse news than people realize, I think. Um, there's one of the things that I, that I realized that, that, came, that um, came up while I was working on this, 
is that war is really, really escalatory even by the standards of really, really escalatory things, right? There are a fair number of phenomena in nature that have been found to follow a power law distribution, right? Virtually none of them are as escalatory as war is. Uh, I think sunspots and possibly earthquakes are the only two phenomena that are more escalatory uh, than, than war. So, uh, you know, the city size is one of those um, distributions, and cities can't have infinite populations, um, but the process that produce, produces war deaths could theoretically, uh, if there were an infinite number of people, could theoretically kill an infinite number of people. Right. So, um, this, is, this is a pretty alarming finding. Right? And what it means is that when we draw a new war from the deck, we don't really know how far it's going to escalate. But we're drawing from the same deck that produced all the wars in the past two centuries. Right? And there were around 95 of those. Um, and out of that 95 or so, um, we drew World War I and World War II, and the Iran-Iraq War, and the Paraguay War. Right? And the deck hasn't changed, right? We're drawing cards from the same deck. That's the really alarming thing. Um, writing this book, that's why the end of chapter five was as, uh, as grim as it was. That's part of the reason for the, for the grimness of the title. Part of the message I want to get across is we think we live in a more peaceful world. We think we live in a world in which wars don't escalate to the same degree that they used to. The evidence doesn't support that conclusion. Next, uh, let's talk about the potency of conflict-causing variables. This is, I was talking with a colleague of mine, Andy Mirabchik, uh, and he was, he was saying, you know, I don't really believe, uh, you know, Pinker's argument for why a decline of war has happened, but if you look at, if you look around the world, you know, you don't see the sorts of flashpoints that you used to see. And I thought, he went down a long list, and as I was going home, I was thinking about it. I said, you know, he's not really talking about, um, a decline in war, he's talking about a decline in the potency of, of things that cause war, right? Uh, territorial disputes that led to war in the past wouldn't lead to war now. Right? That, that the same um, stimulus doesn't produce the same response. And I thought, well, that's a neat question. That's an interesting way of framing it that I hadn't really thought about before. And the phenomena is a lot like uh, the example I have up here of antibiotics, if any of you uh, have had the misfortune of having anyone uh, in your family spend any amount of time in a hospital, you're probably aware that they try to limit your time in the hospital as much as possible. And the reason is that a uh, hospital is a terrible place. It's full of sick people. Uh, and a lot of them have diseases that are resistant to antibiotics uh, because people didn't take their full course of antibiotics. Some of the, some of the bugs survived. And the bugs that survived were differentially um, more resistant to antibiotics. Um, when I went to Oslo, to the, to the Nobel Institute, my uh, three-month-old daughter spiked a fever and we had to go into the hospital. And um, as soon as they found out we were Americans, they put us into isolation, which sort of surprised me. Uh, but they don't have MRSA in, in, uh, in Scandinavia at all. And we had been in a delivery room in the past three months, which put us at risk. And so they wanted to make sure they did swabs to make sure that we weren't actually carriers. Um, there's nothing like, nothing will make you question your membership in the First World Club, like being thrown into isolation as soon as you show up at a hospital. Um, anyway, so this is, the, this is the motivation to keep in mind, right? So what I did was I looked at 10 years of studies of international conflict to try to get a handle on whether or not the causes of war were becoming less potent. Now, what you're seeing up here looks a lot like, I mentioned I have a, a toddler, looks a lot like what she would do on, you know, ideally a piece of paper, but more likely our wall. Um, there's a lot of up, there's a lot of down, there's, there's some back and forth. Uh, if you take a look sort of more formally at all of these trends, what you see is that some causes of war are becoming less potent, some causes of war are becoming more potent, and some are remaining about the same. Um, it's a little bit difficult to 
the, part, of, part of the problem in interpreting these is that war is a relatively rare thing, even, even in periods when the, there's a fair bit of it. Um, and so if you have a, you know, just by chance, you have a string of territorial disputes that erupt into war, what this measure is going to show that is that territorial disputes in that period became more potent causes of war. So there's some, you know, s some of this is polluted by kind of the, the, the choppiness of the frequency of different kinds of conflict. But in any event, you should be able, if, if the causes of war were becoming systematically less potent, what you would see is downward trends in all of these lines, and you don't see that. Okay. So finally, the, the, um, the measure that I think occasions the most thought and discussion and, and uh, is, is worth exploring the most of the rate of conflict initiation. Now, a rate is, uh, is not just a frequency, right? A rate is a frequency divided by the number of opportunities for that thing to happen. Okay. So, uh, so we need a numerator, which is the raw frequency of conflict initiation, and a denominator, which is the number of opportunities for conflict to happen. Uh, our, for our numerator, uh, there's a, a wonderful data set that the Correlates of War people have put out called the Militarized Interstate Dispute Data Set. It measures the threat, display, or use of force. Right? Now, I didn't want to, um, for a variety of reasons, which we can get into in Q&A, I didn't really want to look at the threat or display of force. I thought the most reasonable test of the decline of war thesis would be to look at uses of force. Um, now, in an early version of this project, uh, it was written up in National Geographic, and they asked Professor Pinker what he thought, and his response was, well, not all these militarized interstate disputes are, uh, you know, the same. Some of them, like the U.S. sort of standing offshore and lobbing missiles into some country that can't retaliate, there's no real chance that this is going to escalate to war, whereas others, you know, could. So I thought, well, that's a fair criticism, although I was a little bit frustrated by the fact that you know, part of the reason I chose militarized interstate disputes is that in his book he himself endorsed them, um, as you can see on the bottom point. But I thought, eh, it's not an unreasonable point. So how do I ensure that the militarized interstate disputes that we look at are disputes that actually have some probability of escalating? Well, I just looked at the subset of them that, uh, that involve retaliation, right? So, uh, so these are militarized interstate disputes, disputes that have been, sorry, uh, uses of force by one country against another that have been reciprocated. Okay. That's what's in the numerator. The um, denominator is the number of conflict opportunities. And political scientists a while ago developed a measure for this um, in a 1989 piece by uh, Zev Maus and Bruce Russett. Um, uh, developed this measure of um, uh, politically relevant dyads, right? which is the idea here is that these are pairs of, country that, pairs of countries that can reach each other. Uh, and their criteria for a, for a politically relevant dyad is if you're a major power, you know, major industrialized power, you can reach anybody. Uh, if you're not, you can reach your neighbors. Your neighbors are countries that are directly contiguous or can be reached over less than 400 miles of water. Okay, those are their Croton criteria. A colleague of mine, Austin Carson, and I worked out a refinement in 2011 where we, uh, we used the same variables to measure political relevance, but we estimated their, uh, their weight rather than sort of assuming it. Uh, and we're, that's the, the variable that I'll be using um, for this. Now, picking a test is, again, um, no fun because the data are so skewed. They don't follow a power law distribution, so the same, the, the power law test doesn't apply. But it's not clear what distribution they do follow, and most statistical tests assume some distribution, right? And to the extent that that assumption is wrong, the conclusions are gonna be wrong. So what I've done is to use a change point analysis um, algorithm that finds multiple change points and that is robust to uh, just about any distributional assumptions that you, that you can make, right? So there is good news to come out of this, and that is that there was a drop in the rate of conflict initiation after the end of the Cold War, right, right about exactly at the end of the Cold War, okay? Uh, 
And in fact, the pattern of conflict initiation in some ways resembles the earlier pattern of, of, uh, of war deaths, right? You see a spike in the immediate um, post -Cold, uh, sorry, World War II and post-World War II period, you know, followed by a decline. However, the bad news is that that is about the only peacetime decline that you see over the course of the past couple hundred years. In fact, mostly what you see are increases right, in the rate of conflict initiation. Now, this holds for, again, a, a variety of different operationalizations. I used the original Mao's russet uh, measure up in the top. Um, I used the, uh, the modified, um, sort of a combination of the two. Still got very similar results. There's a slight uptick in the middle of the 18th, or 19th century, rather. Um, and in the bottom graph, what I've done is taken a look at reciprocated and unreciprocated uses of force. And here you see a slight difference in that there's a, a drop in the level of conflict in, right in the middle of the Cold War, right around the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis, which also sort of makes sense. Um, you know, it's, it's reassuring that in a lot of these cases you look at the result and you say, oh, you know, I can, I can tell a story about why that makes sense. Right? And it's not too much of a stretch. Now, people have a lot of questions about these tests. Uh, what about the possibility that um, militarized interstate disputes from earlier periods are systematically undersampled? That's part of the reason that I didn't want to use threats and displays, because I think it's, it's more true of lower level militarized disputes than it is of actual uses of force. But if you take a look at how under, undersampled they would have to be, uh, you'd have to be missing more than about 60% of the militarized disputes prior to World War II in order to believe that uh, there really has been a decline. And that's a, that's a hard case to make. Right? The Corollus of War Project has been going since the 1960s. They've been well funded. Uh, they put a ton of time and effort into measurements of wars and militarized disputes. And the idea that, um, that they'd missed 60% of them prior to World War II um, strikes me as being implausible. Another question. Uh, probably one that's <laughs> pretty relevant here, it's, it's certainly come up a couple of times already in my visit, is what about other kinds of war? Right? What about wars between state actors and non-state actors? Um, especially since uh, at the beginning of this period, uh, the, the formal interstate system was relatively small. Right? There were a lot of non-state actors. Um, the problem is there's no way to come up with a denominator for the, for the measure of rate. Right? If you can tell me how many wars the British could have fought against non-state actors in the 19th century, I'll be happy to run the measure for you and, and tell you what the answer is. But I don't know that there's any objective way to come up with an answer to that question. Right? So but what we can do is just look at the frequency of conflict over time. We can add together wars that fit, all those, fit into all these three categories. So interstate wars. Uh, wars between states and non-state actors, and then wars among non-state actors. And if you pool them all, what you find is a pretty steady rate of conflict over time. Uh, you don't see much of a change at all, right? So, and there are other questions that people have raised in the book. I've relegated them to the appendix, um, but, uh, but I've tried to be as thorough as I can in exploring uh, the question of robustness. So regardless of which measure of war you're looking at, you just don't see a systematic downward trend uh, over the course of a very long period of time. There is uh, a downturn in the rate of conflict initiation at the end of the Cold War, but it's the exception rather than the rule. Okay. So then the question comes up, um, why is it that we see variation in the rate of conflict initiation? Right? Variation does happen. Why is it that we see it? Um, and it, I'm sorry, how, how are we for time? When do, when do we end? I'm trying to gauge half hour. All right, very good. Um, so the fact that there is variation in rates of conflict and initiation raises the question of why. Well, if you look at this graph, a couple answers jump out. One, this is the period of the concert of Europe, right after the Napoleonic Wars, right? when the major powers in Europe got together and decided to try to quash revolution and prevent war from happening. 
Uh, another, obviously, is the end of the Cold War, uh, when the Soviet Union disintegrated and the Soviet communist international order ceased to exist. So the number that the, the answer that jumps out as a possibility is international order. Right? That international order might have something to do with changes in the rate of conflict initiation. So we can take a look at international orders like the liberal international order, like the Cold War communist order, like the Concert of Europe, and ask, you know, were they successful in reducing rates of conflict initiation? But we need to keep in mind that international order can be a double-edged sword. This is a quote from Norbert Elias, a sociologist um, who wrote uh, in the 1930s um, about sort of the, the process by which smaller communities uh, or orders become larger ones. And he said, you know, what happens is you get pacification among, uh, you know, within a group, but then as soon as that happens, they turn their guns outward on other groups of the same size, right? And then pacification happens at that level, and then they turn their guns outward again. Right? So the, the, uh, the, the caveat is that while you should expect to see less conflict within international orders, uh, you may very well see a lot more conflict across international orders, as again we did during the Cold War. And it turns out that pattern holds up reasonably well. I had a graduate student research assistant um, go out and code membership in international orders based on historical sources. And what we found is that uh, the international orders that we listed all ended up being more peaceful than contemporaneous uh, non-ordered relationships, right, or relationships across international orders. Even the League of Nations, which was kind of a surprise to us until we realized that the League essentially, uh, essentially served as a screening device, right? If you wanted peace, you stayed within the League. As soon as you decided you wanted to attack somebody, uh, you'd walk out. So. They, they sort of cheated a little bit by, by ending up with as low, a, as low a rate of conflict initiation as they did. Now, so the book pretty much ends at this point saying, you know, there's a strong relationship between international order and international conflict that's something that we need to, we need to be aware of, right? But the problem is you can imagine a lot of reasons for that relationship to exist. Uh, it's not at all clear why you see the relationship between order and conflict that you do. And as a result, if we want to come up with policy prescriptions, we don't have enough information, right? We need to, we need to learn more about the relationship between order and war before we can give concrete advice to politicians who want to try to decrease, uh, decrease war. So a couple of big questions uh, were left in my mind when I finished this book. And uh, I didn't address them in part because I knew that addressing them was gonna be more technical uh, than I really could do in, uh, in, a, in a general audience book. And in part because they were gonna take even longer and I thought, you know, if I wait much longer, people are gonna forget this, the, this debate ever happened. Um, and my editor was, was nagging me to get, a, to get a final manuscript to him. But, um, but these are questions that are gonna take longer to, to work out. And the first one is, um, what mechanisms drive the relationship between international order and international conflict? Right? Why is it that we see this relationship? And um, what does that tell us about what we can do uh, intentionally to design international order in such a way to minimize the probability of conflict? The other one, and I think for humanity, uh, the biggest one, is why is it that wars are so horrifyingly escalatory and is there anything we can do to change that? Right. And for whatever reason, the, the, the people in my intellectual tribe, the quantitative conflict people, overwhelmingly study conflict initiation. Right? That's been the focus of our research. We don't really study escalation very much at all and when we do, uh, we haven't taken into account the insights that I laid out earlier about the problems with the central limit theorem, right? We'll typically throw variables into a standard regression, maybe we'll log the variables, but we don't take into account the fact that you're gonna get a lot of um, meaningless results out of that. So the amount that we know about why wars escalate is, is shockingly minimal, um, and that's something I think we really need to change. So in part, as a way of, um, of solving this, or getting at these problems, is um, working on 
sort of follow-up projects, uh, I put together a group of graduate students at Ohio State. Um, these people are fantastic. Um, if, you, if you are in a position to hire people, look for them. Uh, they're really terrific, and one of the reasons I put them up is uh, from this point on, everything I talk about should be considered co-authored among, uh, among nine co-authors. Uh, it's been really a, a fantastic experience to work with these really, really smart young people. And the way that we've tried to understand international order and international conflict is as a complex system, right? Where you have local interactions, uh, um, processes of, of war occurrence and international order formation, and then emergent properties that come out of that process, right? So I'll just give you a few uh, examples from, the, from our current project. These are a small number of the implications to come out of the modeling that we've done, um, the, the computational modeling. Now, what we're doing here, you can see the, um, the, the big colored dots uh, are hierarchs. They're, they're big powers that have um, put out a shingle and said, if you are uh, interested in giving up some of your autonomy, whether it's uh, in terms of policy or basing rights or money, uh, we will make you part of a hierarchy and we will provide services that can help prevent you from getting into war. Primarily, uh, we'll provide information that you don't already have that may help you to avoid conflict. And in this simulation, you can see the impact of information provision as it goes from less to more. Right? You, see, you see that it produces uh, this sort of clustering, right? That is, the more information provision the hierarchy uh, uh, provides, the greater the appeal of international order and uh, the lower the rate of conflict within international orders. Right? Another process that we're looking at is the relationship between ideology and conflict and what that means for, for international conflict. During the Cold War, lots and lots of international conflict was about the tension between the democratic capitalist world on the one hand and the communist world on the other. Um, in other periods, conflicts have been less about ideology than that. So what happens when you, um, when you sort of artificially change uh, the amount of conflict in a system that's due to ideology from relatively low to relatively high? What you see is this interesting screening effect whereby countries that are already not prone to fight each other, uh, like democratic capitalist countries and communist countries, tend to sort themselves into different camps. Right, so you get the appearance of uh, an increase in conflict across camps, but in fact it's conflict that would have happened already. Right? And finally, most relevant from, uh, from today's perspective, is uh, we, we varied the extent to which international orders are consensual. Right? You could either have the hierarchy set the rules of the game and say this is how things are going to happen, or you can have it negotiate with its potential partners and, and work out rules and um, principles that are, are more consensual in nature. And what happens when you make international orders more consensual, this is arrayed along a two-dimensional space because it reflects sort of an, a, a notional ideological spectrum. You've got one country on the far, one hierarchy on the far left represented by a star, one hierarchy on the far right represented by a star, a few countries that have already joined the hierarchy, and a bunch down below uh, that haven't. Right? So as you make these hierarchies more consensual, what happens is they become appealing to more members. However, what you see on the right is that the star disappears. What does that mean? The hierarch has left its own hierarchy. It's decided that the ideal point of the hierarchy has gotten so far away from the, the ideals and principles of the hierarch that it no longer wants to have anything to do with it. Right? So one of the things that we can evoke in this model is uh, a situation in which uh, a hierarchy gives up on its own hierarchy. Um, again, not too much of a stretch um, to think about what that means in the context of current politics. So some closing observations that get back around sort of more to, to your world than to our, uh, our lab and our simulations. The first observation, and I think I've, I think I've made this point um, enough, but I also in some ways don't feel like I can ever make it enough, uh, 
uh, and that is that war is really a lot more dangerous than just about anybody today realizes. Right? The escalatory potential of war is pretty horrifying, and it hasn't decreased. And if we were to sit down with politicians and the top brass in the military and talk about how it is that we can make it less deadly, right now we don't have a great handle on the answer to that question. Okay. Observation number two, talking about NATO. Um, when I take a look, and I, this is not my literature very much, but when I take a look at the kinds of threats that NATO is focused on, the sort of third horizon issues, it strikes me that they are, uh, they're designed to address um, what Aaron Frank and his colleagues in the PNAS paper a few years ago called femto risks, that is tiny, tiny, tiny risks that may nevertheless explode, right? So they're trying to find, uh, and I mean terrorism is a good example of, uh, of a femto risk, right? Um, you know, it's, it's not, a, not a common occurrence. When it does happen, for the most part, um, it, it doesn't kill a lot of people, but when it does happen and it kills a lot of people, it's a really big deal, right? So the focus has been on femto risks, really small risks that have the potential to blow up, right? And partly for that reason, I think um, we're, we're used to thinking of NATO as a military alliance, but I think it may be even more important as the military core uh, of the Western liberal order because the Western liberal order, like other orders, um, creates an environment of resilience that, that helps to prevent um, the kinds of occurrences that NATO is interested in preventing. Yeah. Everybody asks about China. Um, frankly, I'm, I'm to be clear, I'm a little more worried about the dissolution of the Western liberal order than I am about the formation of a Chinese order right now. But it's important to emphasize in a world when we're talking about, you know, the Thucydides trap, that um, from this perspective at least, uh, China's power is not nearly as much of a threat as its potential to form a rival order, okay? So the rise of China uh, in and of itself is not something that, that worries me nearly as much as the possibility that um, the Chinese will become sufficiently alienated from the principles of world order that now exist that it will feel uh, that it makes sense to form an alternative world order. Now, uh, current research suggests that they wouldn't have very many partners in doing so, um, but it's still a concern to, to have in mind, I think. Um, all right, fifth observation. Again, if you were to put together academics and policymakers and top brass and say, all right, how are we gonna design a new international order that's gonna be optimal for today's security environment? We don't have a really good answer to that, right? This discussion happened after the end of the Cold War. There were articles about, should we do something like a new concert of Europe, right? Would a concert system be a good idea for the international system right now, and those, those debates died out pretty quickly. The answer was, well, the Western liberal order worked pretty well, right, and it's gonna to continue to work pretty well, and it has, but it was optimized for the Cold War environment, right? This is an environment we're no longer in. It is, from my perspective, unambiguously time to begin thinking about what we need uh, in terms of a new international order or a redesigned international order and we don't have a great sense of what that should look like right now. Uh, and finally, the process of developing uh, an idea for a new international order is gonna be challenging um, because international orders direct conflict outward because it's conflict about things that they care about, right? One of the first questions I got at the Nobel Institute when I delivered these, these findings were, what about the responsibility to protect, right? What about uh, NATO's doctrine that um, you know, the rights of, of um, people who are in the process of being slaughtered trump um, you know, sovereignty of the state. Right? And you know, we may end up deciding that, that um, wars like that are worth fighting, but they are wars, right? They don't, they don't fail to count just because they're for a good cause. Right? And as long as we continue to care about things 
like humanitarian intervention more than we care about peace, we're gonna continue to have wars. And it's gonna, so it's gonna be a real challenge to find uh, a design for an international institution or, or an international order uh, that's gonna minimize the prospects for conflict. So to close, I'll leave you with a, a quote from the 2018 National Defense Strategy of the United States that uh, resonated with me very much. Um, in the current environment, I think we are, uh, we, we should be a lot more concerned than we are about international order and international conflict. Um, and unfortunately, I, I wish I could come here and tell you that we knew more about it than we do. Um, but I think as far as, as far as my own research priorities and I think the research priorities we should be focusing on, uh, these are the kinds of questions we need to be asking. And I'll leave it at that, thank you. Dr. Bremler, a quick question, more of an observation, and it was from the earlier part of your talk when you're talking about the, when you take the when you uh, take the log in the log and you get a downward slope and you mm -hmm. notice that a, a shallower slope is more prone and a steeper slope is uh, is, is less prone. It seems like, uh, and I may I'm bringing in the ideas from economics, but it seems like almost like inverse elasticity, where where you have an Ill a stickiness for war, where the uh, the slopes represent sort of el uh, elastic curves. Right. Is, is that just some no, no, that's, that's, that's not an unreasonable observation. The, what, what I didn't get into is the, the process by which power, war distributions, power law distributions happen. And uh, there's, a, there's a terrific book um, that Duncan Watts wrote called Everything is Obvious Once You Know the Answer. Uh, I love the title. But he talks about how it is that really big things get really big, right? And the answer very often is because they were big to begin with. Right, so um, the the I think the analog of elasticity in the in the, in this analogy is the ease with with which um, smaller things become bigger things. Right, so his example, um, one of my favorites, is uh, he went to see the Mona Lisa because he wanted to figure out why it was the most famous painting in the world, and it turns out you know, he walked past a bunch of other da Vinci's and said that they look pretty good too. I don't really know. Uh, so he looked into the history of the Mona Lisa and he found that it really wasn't a very popular, uh, you know, very popular uh, painting until it was stolen. And then in a very high profile case, it was returned. And because it was returned, because they wrote it up in the paper, people came to see it. And because people came to see it, more people came to see it. And that, that just snowballed. So the, 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 the way that I think about elasticity and the concept of uh, power law distribution is um, how reactive the system is. Like when, when people go to see it, how many more people go to see it subsequently? Do they tell two friends? Do they tell five friends? Do they tell 10? You know, something along those lines. Uh, sir, could I cope? Um, I was just wondering, because you said at the beginning, uh, had you asked undergraduate you, would you be doing statistics to figure out you know, international relations and war? How did you, was it strictly reading this book that you were like, wow, these sound strange, I'm gonna oh, write Lord my own no. book to refute it, or how did you get into it? How did I get into statistics? So, this is a, kind of a funny story. The, the guy that I mentioned, the, the one who, so I was at Chicago, I was debating where to go for graduate school. And one of the graduate students said, you should go talk to Chris Aiken, uh, who was a professor there. And if, you know, I've never met the man, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna bother him. And she said, okay. And then she came back the next day and said, I made an appointment for you. <laughs> and this is one of those you know, moments in your life when uh, you know, like a big red flashing arrow appears. And I said, you know, what, what are you doing? She said, oh, he's great, he's friendly, he'll be fine. So I walk into his office and he asked me the question about what did I think of statistics and I told him I thought it was crap. And he said, uh, well, you know, go to Michigan and try the introductory statistics course. And if you don't like it, drop out and, uh, you know, and never use numbers again. So I did. I went to Michigan. I came to the first course and uh, you know, sat down, uh, the first class in the, in the course. And who should walk in to teach it but Chris Aiken, who had moved from Chicago to Michigan uh, 
over the summer. He didn't tell me that he was going to do that. And he just looked at me and smiled. And I thought, oh, I'm never going to drop this damn class. Uh, and so, and it was torture. It was set theory. It was, we were using mini tabs to do the analyses. It was, I mean, it was fingernails on a chalkboard all the way. And then uh, about halfway through the class, he ran a simple, I think it was a regression analysis. And I looked at it and came up to him afterward and I said, so, it was one of the dumbest things I ever said. I said, you know, so we can use these things to figure out why it is that people do what they do? And he looked at me like, you know, I just picked my knuckles up off the floor and my tail had just fallen off. And he said, yeah, yeah, that's why we're here. And I said, I'm in. You know, I'm one of those people who, you know, in, in math class, uh, you know, in, in high school, uh, they said, you know, prove that A times B equals B times A. And I said, why? I, I, don't, I don't care. There's no motivation here. Um, but as soon as motivation existed, as soon as I realized that um, statistics could give us insight into human behavior that nothing else could. Uh, all of a sudden, I was all over it. And now, I mean, half of my publications are in political methodology. They're, they're statistics papers. Um, and if my, if my high school math teacher could see me now, um, he, he wouldn't last long. Uh, you know, he'd <laughs> just keel over dead from shock. Um, so yeah, it was a huge transformation for me. And it, it, came, it just came from the realization in graduate school uh, that, that statistics could help us understand why it is that people do what they do. Um, so by the time I read this book, um, you know, I had a long string of, of uh, publications uh, in statistics under my belt. This wasn't the thing that prompted me to learn about statistics, but it was something that prompted me to, um, to use the knowledge that I accrued uh, to try to to try to answer the question. Sure. Sure. Sir, I've got one more. If, uh, yeah. if anyone else has one, I, I'm curious. Uh, you know, the description of the earthquake folks uh, yeah. living in earthquake prone region. Why do you think this has not gotten more traction than, than this notion that we live in a dangerous time, and instead folks are tended to gravitate toward the notion that. We're in a more peaceful time. Is it? Is your assessment? And folks are just internally optimistic. Uh, there's. I'm just curious as as to why, in your thoughts, that that may be a notion that seems to have some staying power despite sort of the data and the, the larger historical trends right. that counter that. No, that's a great question. Um, I think it's for a couple of reasons. First of all, and and most mostly they have to do with the the really, really counterintuitive um, implications of power law distributions. Um, you can have long strings of very small observations without anything fundamental changing about the system. Now, we're not used to that, right? We are used to a world of things that are roughly normally distributed, things like height, right? Or um, uh, let's stick with height. So um, if you walk past a couple of people in the hallway who are unusually tall or unusually short, you can expect that the next few people are going to tend to balance out that trend, right? That over the course of 15 or 20 or 50 or 100 people, you, the average height is going to be something close to population average, right? Um, and so we tend to update pretty quickly based on those numbers. We tend, to, we tend to carry around an idea of what we can expect in our head, and we update that idea based on our observations. Well, when you do that with, a, with things that are distributed like a power law, it leads you entirely in the wrong direction because you're updating on you know, very small observations uh, and you start to think, gee, well, all we have is really small observations, right? We're not going to see a big war, right? And then one comes out of the blue that surprises you. Or you do the opposite. After a big war, you say, oh, well, you know, we really need to, to protect ourselves against another big war. Well, it's still not very likely, right? So we... Um, you know, when, when we update what we believe, we tend to do it in a way that's optimized for a world where things are pretty normally distributed. We are not, as, as creatures, we are not built, we did not evolve um, to understand uh, phenomena that have such a skewed distribution. Professor Reller, thanks again for your, uh, for your comments today. We have to wrap this up, so please join me for a round of applause. All right, thank you. Thank you.